Hi, this is SQ64. It's a desktop sequencer from Korg. It has three polyphonic melodic tracks and a fourth drum track. It can sequence over MIDI and also has plenty of CV outputs for modular or semi-modular gear. In this video, I'll take a look at what it can do, explore its workflow in detail, and take a look at overall pros and cons compared to other sequencers. More of what you're hearing now at the end of this video. Let's get started. Before I start, a quick disclosure, Korg sent SQ64 over for review, but as always, they have no say over the content of this video. This channel is funded by viewers who subscribe to my content and book updates on Patreon, the ad you just skipped or YouTube Premium, and the occasional affiliate link in the description, which helps the channel regardless of the product you choose to buy. Let's start with an overview. Like I mentioned, SQ64 is a four track sequencer. Tracks A, B, and C are polyphonic melodic tracks and track D is a drum track which can sequence up to 16 different parts of a drum kit. Its most noteworthy feature, of course, is the 64 pad grid. The pads aren't velocity sensitive, but they're fairly sensitive to touch, so you can fill in those quick hi-hat rolls. The mode buttons on top and on the sides are click buttons, and they're a bit harder to press, but not by much. There are a few benefits to having 64 pads. One of them is that alongside seeing 16 steps per bar for each of the four sequences, in parallel, and here they're running, by the way, at separate rates, which is why you see these moving forward at different rates. Anyway, aside from that, you can also see up to 64 steps on an individual track. So if I were to go into my, uh, say, hi-hats here, in this case, I've got a 32-step pattern, and I could easily edit each of its steps. And that goes, of course, up to 64 steps. The pads have a few additional modes. So for example, if I go to a melodic track, track C, and then hit shift, pitch, and C, you could see a few keyboard layouts here, whether it's a chromatic layout. So these are the white keys and these are the black keys. And there are a few scale options here as well. There aren't any custom scales, but uh, you've got the usual suspects here. Anyway, so the chromatic layout is one of the available layouts, and if I go into global settings, and we'll talk about settings later, but let's just go into this quickly, there are two other modes. You saw keys modes. There's an isomorphic layout, which is sort of like a, um, a bass guitar. Not in that it only plays bass notes, but in that every row is kind of like a string in a guitar, a fourth above the row below it. And then there's an octave mode, which does pretty much as you'd expect. Within the scale, of course. The pads also have a few performance functions. So if you hit shift, you get into a mode where you can control mutes for the drum tracks or for any of the main tracks, relative speeds for the different tracks, a few playback directions, a few sync options for polyrhythmic tracks and an option to clear the tracks. And there are a few other views you can view the patterns you have in your project or the projects you have on your SQ64. While we're on this topic, you can store 64 projects overall. I've got three here and they're lit up and I could easily load up any one just by pressing the project buttons. It does take a bit of a uh, time to load a project and it will stop playback if you do. Once you load up a project, everything is immediately accessible all four tracks and up to 16 pattern options for each of the tracks. Each pattern can have up to 64 steps and you can chain patterns in chains that are up to 16 patterns long. You can also activate patterns anytime you like in an Ableton Live style grid and you can sync the chain to either a step, a beat, a bar, or a pattern. From a connectivity perspective, SQ64 has eight gate outputs for the first eight out of 16 drums in a drum kit. Then there are three sets of monophonic CV gate and mod outputs for each of the three other melodic tracks. The tracks are polyphonic, but they can only send one note out at a time over CV. They can, of course, send up to eight notes at a time over MIDI. 
SQ64 also has analog sync both in and out, and then three MIDI ports. These are 3.5 millimeter TRS-A type ports. Two outputs, one of which can be assigned as a MIDI through, and one input, which is important because if velocity sensitive pads are important to you, you can always connect a velocity sensitive keyboard or keypad to this and sequence from there. SQ64 can also send MIDI and be powered over USB, unfortunately using the micro USB standard and not USB-C, and it can also be powered with a 9 volt center positive adapter. The power adapter and the MIDI dongles aren't included, I'll link to a few options in the description below, and it can't be powered by batteries, at least not AA batteries, you can of course power it with a USB power brick. SQ64 has two power modes. It can work on 500 milliamps if you only have a USB 2 connection, but you really want to give it two amps of power because the screen and the LEDs light up much brighter. The build is quite solid. It seems like an all metal enclosure with good heft to it. The screen is OLED viewable from any angle. And then finally, if you wanted, you could also use SQ64 as a generic MIDI controller. These send out notes and these send out MIDI CCs in one of four banks. As of the making of this review, there was no editor to let you edit these or transfer files back and forth. Hopefully that will be forthcoming. Okay, so that's the overview. Let's dive in a little bit deeper and look at how you sequence and use the SQ64. Before you start, you'll need to tell it what it's talking to, meaning what kind of CV devices and MIDI devices it's connected to and which track should speak to which device. I won't go over all the settings in the global settings, but it supports a few standards, both S-Trig and V-Trig for gates. Even if you never use these for modular or CV-based instruments, these LEDs are actually pretty instrumental in giving you an overview of what's being triggered where. It would be nice if that would be shown here somehow for the, um, the drum patterns. But right now, this is a good way to know what's being triggered or not. Anyway, so O Coast is being controlled by CV here in track C, then track A is controlling the reface CP, and that's with MIDI going out of output one into the back there, and then the Volca sample is on track D, and that's going out to this MIDI output into here. It's obviously important not to send information out the outputs you don't want to. So for example, for track A, I'm sending information out MIDI output number one, but not out MIDI output number two. I could disable USB if I wanted. I'm not using track B in this project. Track C is off for everything because it's going out the CV outputs, and then track D has MIDI RX, doesn't matter, but MIDI TX set to off, off, and on for MIDI 2. Okay, so that's set up. Let's see how you actually sequence. I'll load up a brand new empty project for this. Now with SQ64, you sequence gates, pitch, and modulation. There's one modulation lane for each of the tracks separately. Let's start with drum tracks because they don't have a pitch track, so they're a little bit easier. Track D is always the drum track, and then I hold this and select what I want to sequence. This is my kick. I've programmed this in global settings, and then step sequencing is just as you'd imagine. If I wanted to add hi-hats, I could do that. And my snare is here. And yeah, pretty straightforward. It would have been nice if there was a view maybe for four drum tracks at a time, but um, yeah, I mean, pretty straightforward. So that's drum sequencing. Let's maybe change this to make it a little bit more interesting. Melodic sequencing can be either step-by-step step, like we just did, or you can play live using an external keyboard or using the key modes here. You could sequence gate events separately and then go ahead and edit the pitches for those gates with the knobs, but you could also use the um, built-in keyboard if we go into, let's just maybe turn this off, go into again, shift A or shift pitch A, and then use this keyboard. One disadvantage that I saw is that you can't set a velocity that's less than 127 when you enter notes. This way you can edit velocity later on. So if I wanted to enter a chord for this step, I would just do that and play a chord. It appears after you release the notes. And then I could go ahead into velocity mode and change the velocity of this note so it won't be so loud and just hit play. And I get that chord. Notice that it was a very short chord because I only programmed it for that one step, not for any others. Now, unfortunately, currently, there's no way to set a length that's longer than one step. You can start tying notes if you wanted, like this, 
but then you'd need to program the same chord for each step. Hopefully they'll add that later on. There's also a time mode where if you hold this, it goes into gate time mode and you can tie steps like this, but you'd still need to copy the note data from step to step. Anyway, hopefully they'll add a long gate mode as well. Another option is just to record live using either the built-in keyboard. So just hit record and hit a chord whenever you want. And that will stay for as long as you pressed it. And then the other option is to just record using an external keyboard. This will of course automatically record both note length and velocity. I couldn't find a quantization feature here. Maybe I missed it. This does support micro timing, by the way. Very interestingly, if I slow down the tempo all the way, it supports micro timing for different notes on a single step. So if I hit record here, and pardon the slow sequence, but let's maybe record this. You can hear that it was recorded really nicely. Now, if I go into edit the pitch of these steps, you can see that the notes are there. And if I look at the gate, there's this little star there next to the offset that uh, I guess designates that there are different offsets and different ties here. Anyway, super cool functionality, I think, and it would be nice if you could just edit the offsets on a per note basis if you wanted. So that's basic sequencing. Let's take a look at a few more advanced features. When you edit a track, there are sort of three modes to do it. There's an overall track mode when you don't hold a note, and there's another view into potentially additional parameters when you hit shift. So for example, here, uh, in pitch mode, these are the basic parameters that I can change that apply to the entire track. And if I hold shift, you can see additional parameters. So parameter set one, parameter set two, and then when you hold the step, you see parameter set number three. This applies to each of these modes, the gate, pitch, and mod modes. So let's take a look at what these parameters are very briefly. In gate mode, you can choose the number of steps, in a track, that's pretty straightforward, up to 64 steps and down to one if you like. You can rotate the pattern around. Fill is an interesting feature which we'll get to in the performance section. And then slide is glide when you have tied notes, which is nice. There are no extra shift parameters here, luckily. And if you hold a step in gate mode, you'll see a few other functions. We talked about ties and offsets. Probability lets you decrease the chance that a step will happen or have the step alternate one every certain number of patterns. So this will play on the third pattern of every three patterns. And there are a few other combos like twice out of four patterns and so on. Let's get this back to 100. And then you have step divisions, which are either basic ratchets or all kinds of descending and ascending patterns. Then if we head out to pitch, remember there are three things, the basic parameters, shift parameters, and then step parameters. You can transpose a, a pattern if you like. We talked about the different scales. Poly slash ARP is a very interesting option. So you can turn a track into monophonic, that's simple. Chord is just regular. And then ARP arpeggiates the notes within a particular step. So let's, for example, just delete these guys and uh, program a simple chord into here. So let's hold the step and then say, program these four notes. This is the chord we just programmed. Now, if I go into ARP mode, what it does is <laughs> arpeggiate, like I said, on that particular step. So that's pretty fast, right? I would expect this to work differently. If I reduce the tempo all the way down, you could hear it again on that step. And then there are a few ARP scale options. So I'll reduce that even further, this is the slowest rate. So again, one step, slowest possible tempo. And you finally get an arpeggiated pattern for that step. So it's cool for either really slow patterns or quick trills. I think ideally they would just add more divisions here. So not just let you multiply the arp rate, but also divide it and then just play it like you would a normal arpeggiator across more steps. Anyway, those are the settings here. You can also transpose the, um, the keyboard that you used to play over here. And then one other nice option, if I just turn off the arpeggiator. So that's my chord. And you can also uh, apply certain inversions to it, depending on the number of notes you have. So inversion one and inversion two. 
and inversion three. So, yeah, and this goes down as well. Anyway, those are the pitch mode or pitch view options. Let's talk about the mod or modulation tracks. Again, each of the tracks has one modulation lane. Variation is an element of randomness for each of the values. And then you've got a curve, either sharp transitions or smooth transitions. That's for CV. And then if you hit shift, you can change the destination of the modulation from velocity to any one of the CCs. That's relevant, obviously, for MIDI only. And then you can just hold the step and set the value for that step to whatever you want. So that's how you enter notes into steps. Let's take a look at a few performance options. I'll increase the tempo here. And let's maybe program just a simple sequence so we can hear what's going on. Okay, so this is our masterpiece. You've got mutes, so we can mute the entire drum track or the individual drum subtracks or lanes. And then aside from mutes, if you look at the labels below here, you see a few additional options. So let's get our pattern going and uh, yeah, the, the drums, why not? So I could say slow down this pattern too. Okay, slow right, including triplet intervals. And it goes as high as this. So eight different options, these divisions, and then triplet versions of each. You've got a few sync options if you're creating polyrhythmic tracks, meaning tracks that have different lengths or different timings. If you make changes here, by the way, when none of these pads are lit up, then you change all the patterns. So I'm now shortening all the patterns. And if you choose a specific pattern, then you can shorten just that pattern. So let's have this be eight steps and this is 16. That's fine. Anyway, a few other options are playback options. So if I hit shift, I could play in reverse, bounce back and forth. Stochastic is sort of like a drunken walk forwards, and random is totally random. And you could uh, clear tracks if you want. Then there's an interesting loop mode. So if I hit play here, and then uh, just hold a range, you can get stuck in this range. And I could have, when it's stuck, have it go faster or slower, which is nice. And just release it by double tapping. And yeah, uh, play randomly. And there's another mode where you can just select steps. So that's a fun way to experiment with your patterns. Then there's swing, which can be either global or just for track. Again, same idea as before. You select the track that you want to swing, let's say the drum track, and apply swing just to that. And yeah, that's a bit of a mess, but you get the idea. And then final fun performance feature is fill. I remember I promised you we'd talk about that. So what that does is insert notes in empty spaces. So when you apply it to all the tracks, it can be chaotic. But if you just apply it, say, to the drone track, it can be uh, pretty cool. So all of these are unmuted. I could just mute separate tracks and just have it apply to the drone tracks that are unmuted. But uh, yeah, this is just 5% fill. Again, pattern before. Simple, but with a few fills. It becomes more interesting and it can go as far as you want with whatever's programmed here. Let's go crazy. Okay, that's too much. Anyway, a fun performance feature there. Before we head out to the pros and cons, let's take another look at global mode just to make sure we didn't miss anything. So the way that this works is that if you press the global button repeatedly, it'll move between different parameters that you can edit. But as you see, as I press this button, it goes through different locations. I can always press these locations directly to access the parameters that I want to change. And there are global, global settings and then track global settings. 
And again, you can page through those. And then there are drum global settings, which are overall for all the tracks, or I could just press a specific track and edit its parameters, a specific drum subtrack. Settings also hides access to a few performance features, including the ability to transpose sequences using the pads. Anyway, I wanted to show you that. With that said, let's wrap up and talk about the pros and cons. I like to separate these into hardware and software topics, hardware being things that can't change and firmware or software things that might be added in a future firmware update. On the physical hardware side, my main gripe is that the pads aren't velocity sensitive and the micro USB port, these things are always a pain to plug in correctly and I was hoping we'd seen the last of them. Other than those two things, I think the form factor of the hardware is actually pretty darn good. There are obviously form factor trade-offs compared to other sequencers. So for example, the Keystep or the Keystep Pro have piano style keys and this doesn't, or the Beatstep Pro has velocity sensitive pads and a knob per step. Whereas here you first need to choose the channel and then the step and then edit its parameters. But this has 64 pads. So it's not that one is better than the other, it's just a trade-off and what suits your workflow better. You can also look at SQ64 as BYOK, meaning bring your own keyboard or pads. If you're not happy with the fact that it doesn't have either a built-in keyboard or velocity sensitive pads, just hook up a MIDI controller and sequence with that. The workflow is built for it. So that's it on the hardware side. In terms of firmware or software, there were a few bugs that I encountered here, but I'm using pre-release firmware, so hopefully a firmware update will fix those soon. Aside from that, there are a few features that I'd like to see here. I mentioned most of them earlier. First, the arpeggiator is just this close to being great. Right now it's limited to arpeggiate on a per step basis, which is an odd decision. They should just let you arpeggiate across the entire track easily. Same goes for note ties. Like I mentioned earlier, a simple long note length would do away with the need to mess around with ties. A few other things that would be nice to see, maybe faster step sequencing where you could just enter notes and they would be populated step by step into the sequencer. And a feature that you should be aware of, which is probably hardware, but maybe firmware, is that there's only one modulation lane some sequencers have more than one mod lane per track. I mentioned earlier that playback stops when you load projects just for a bit, but it does stop. And also global settings applies to all projects too. So you can't have a setting for one set of hardware. And then if you swap out your drum machine with something else, a setting for that. So those are the biggest firmware cons or things I'd like to see added in a future firmware update. On the pros side, I think that SQ64 strikes an excellent balance between size, price, and features. It only has four tracks, so if you're looking for something for a large setup, it may not do the trick, but for medium-sized setups, it's a great brain that you should consider, whether that setup contains MIDI instruments, modular gear, or both. And if you'd like to learn more about how to make a setup like this work, feel free to check out my ever-expanding book of electronic music ideas, tips, and tricks available to the good people who support this channel on Patreon. Hit like if this was useful, ring the YouTube bell below to make sure you don't miss the next one. Thanks for watching.